so uh, for the sake of time, we'll move on to uh, my talk, uh, the last talk, and then we'll go over the uh, uh, Q&A. Um, and this talk will go over the uh, traumatic carotid uh, dissection, which is a very controversial topic in terms of uh, uh, diagnosis, investigation, even management. Uh, first of all, I have no disclosures. Uh, we'll go, we're going to go over some introduction, uh, some of the imaging modalities and advances in imaging modality that may actually uh, help in the decision-making process, and some of the uh, uh, management strategies or proposed man management uh, strategies. So uh, carotid dissection is a rare entity. Uh, it affects two to three per 100,000 population. It can be classified uh, according to the etiology, whether it's a spontaneous or a traumatic, or uh, according to the location, whether it's extracranial or intracranial, or specifically extradural versus intradural. Uh, around 4% of carotid dissection are related to severe trauma. Uh, and it can occur to a blunt trauma to the head uh, uh, or the neck in any rapid movement in any, uh, uh, any axis. Uh, the <clears throat> traumatic carotid dissection is a leading cause of stroke in the young. Uh, it presents with uh, uh, only 10%, which is uh, a small, uh, small proportion of patients present with immediate symptom after the injury. So the majority of those patients are asymptomatic. And the other thing is that in the context of a severe trauma, when the patients are unconscious or intubated, it might be difficult um, to elicit some of the clinical findings to detect if this patient has a, uh, a carotid dissection. And also those patients, they cannot communicate headache or neck pain, for example. Um, so um, the, the clinical presentation, uh, as we all know, can range from neck pain, headache, to a serious neurological sequelae in the form of ischemic event, or a, a hemorrhagic stroke, or specifically a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, the <clears throat> concerning thing is that 80% of those patients, uh, their, stroke, their stroke evolved uh, within the first week. Um, uh, so the first week from the injury, or the first week from the development of the traumatic dissection. And once that happened, the mortality rate is as high as 40%. So high index of suspicion and early detection is key to uh, manage those patients and try to prevent significant neurological sequelae. Now, in terms of imaging, we'll start with the basic. As we know, the ultrasonography is a well-known and well-described modality of imaging, uh, especially the Doppler mode, not the B mode. Uh, the uh, downside of that is that it's limited to the cervical segment. It's very difficult to assess intracranial uh, dissection using ultrasound. It has poor sensitivity compared to other imaging modality, uh, which is basically around 68 to 70 percent. We can visualize the, mu the mural hematoma, flow aberration to detect if there's any flow changes across the area of the dissection. We can also visualize mobile flap and luminal uh, thrombi. Uh, this, for example, <clears throat> uh, an, a Doppler ultrasound showing the difference uh, in the flow, aber uh, the flow aberration or the difference in flow uh, in the mural hematoma, which is here. And we can see um, uh, the waves in this image versus the actual, uh, the true lumen. Uh, also another image, when we, when we look at some of the axial images on the ultrasound, we can see the, uh, uh, the double lumen sign, either in the sagittal uh, image or the axial one. Uh, and those are uh, mainly diagnostic uh, features uh, to diagnose the uh, uh, arterial dissection. But as I mentioned, the sensitivity is relatively low and the, uh, it has a limitation that it cannot detect intracranial uh, pathologies. <clears throat> CTA, as we all know, is uh, uh, a modality of choice, especially in the context of trauma. Most of those patients, they go to the CT scanner to get the pan CT. And we typically include the CTA, especially in someone who's comatosed, uh, as a part of the uh, assessment to his brain or neurological function and uh, uh, to see if there's any significant damage. Uh, so CT is uh, the uh, way to go in the context of trauma. It has very high sensitivity and specificity, as we all know, and it can be superior to the MRA <clears throat> in detecting intimal flap and pseudoaneurysms. Uh, and also, uh, and I think this will probably be an evolving thing that may guide in the uh, uh, decision-making process in terms of management, it, we have the advantage of CT perfusion as well. 
So with the, <clears throat> with the, pres with the presence of a dissection, for example, you can uh, get a sense of how much the brain is being perfused in that uh, hemisphere. And uh, could this be a, a case that I would manage medically or manage with an intervention, whether endovascular stenting or surgical reconstruction? <clears throat> this is, for example, a uh, uh, the second. The uh, uh, CTA showing uh, uh, the section of the right internal carotid and also with a significantly diminished flow <clears throat> that appears in the middle image in the mean transit time, the MTT, but there's no signif significant change in the volume. Uh, so CTA has this advantage of high sensitivity, high specificity and uh, high specificity in detection and also in assessing the uh, impact of the dissection on the, uh, on the epsilateral hemisphere. <clears throat> um, the uh, uh, MRI and MRA is the best way to visualize the intramural hematoma, especially in the T2 uh, fat saturated uh, image. Uh, the intramural hematoma can be missed if the scan is done earlier, if it's done uh, 24 or 48 hours uh, uh, after, immediately after the injury, it can be missed. Um, MRI also has the advantage of looking at the flare sequences as well as the uh, uh, as well as the uh, uh, diffusion weighted image to see if there is already established infarct or silent infarct or to see if there is any uh, areas of penumbra that might be affected by the hemodynamic change that occur after the uh, the dissection. Uh, the MRI can be superior to angiogram. Uh, especially if there is low, no luminal abnormality or if there is vessel occlusion, because as we know, uh, 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 the cerebral angiogram is a luminogram. We only see what goes into the lumen and we don't see what's happening into the wall unless there is a compromise to the lumen. So uh, the MRI has this advantage over DSA in, in certain circumstances. <clears throat> this is an image showing the intramural hematoma on the fat saturated image of the left internal carotid artery. Cerebral angiogram, as you all know, the gold standard for luminal imaging. It's an invasive test. It has overall 1% or less than 1% risk of complications. Um, we usually reserve it when there's a high index of suspicion in a negative non-invasive test. <clears throat> uh, those are some of the findings that we typically see in an angiogram, the double human sign and uh, the flame sign uh, on the uh, cerebral angiogram. Now, one of the advance, uh, advances in imaging, and this is uh, OCT basically, or optical coherence tomography has been approved uh, in cardiac angiography uh, for many years. And uh, they use it to uh, visualize the, uh, the, uh, the lumen of the vessel pre and after stenting, uh, just to, to, to determine if the stent is well placed and if there is any intraluminal uh, narrowing or uh, excessive endothelialization, for example. Um, the disadvantage of the OCT, it's an invasive test. You need to do an angiogram to be able to do an OCT. <clears throat> you need to have an OCT imaging catheter and you need to have an OCT analysis system. So it needs some uh, supply to, to have it done. It's not uh, unlike the readily available CTA or MRA, for example, an, an, an angiogram. Uh, it has the best resolution of all imaging. Uh, 10 times better resolution than any other imaging uh, modality, even the, the angiogram. And it displays the vessel wall location uh, and the extent of the pathology. Uh, now, this case report demonstrated two cases that we used the OCT in imaging of the carotid dissection. Uh, so basically, uh, just gonna go out of the presentation mode to show my marker. So this is the internal carotid. Typically you have a guide catheter in the uh, common carotid artery, and then you have your OCT imaging. A catheter uh, across the, uh, the, uh, the, the section. And then <clears throat> uh, uh, we, we do the special angiogram with the OCT analysis, and this is what you get in terms of imaging. So you look at the internal, uh, 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 the, the interior of the blood vessel, basically. So in this image, for example, at A, which is distal to the pseudoaneurysm that we can see here, we see the mural hematoma in that location. And <clears throat> in B, for example, we can see the dome of the aneurysm and we can see some part, some of the intramural hematoma between the intima and the media layer of the, of the vessel wall. <clears throat> 
and in C, for example, which is proximal to the pseudoaneurysm, which would, what we expect, we can see the uh, intimal tear and it's covered by a thrombus. So uh, it's very fascinating how we can um, uh, visualize all of these things. And we can probably predict that those things or those imaging might have a potential to guide the management uh, down the road, <clears throat> especially if you have, for example, a specific size of a mural hematoma or a specific measurement of an intimal flap. This might pred predict in the future that those lesions will probably respond to medical management or might need an intervention uh, sooner rather than later. And uh, this was the second case that um, uh, was demonstrated with an OCT imaging. <clears throat> and again, it shows the layers of the vessel wall and it shows the uh, hematoma and the exact location of the intimal flap. Uh, and OCT in, 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 uh, in those two cases, one of the cases actually OCT detected another intimal flap that was not picked up by the CTA. Uh, and this definitely has a huge implication on management. For example, if we're planning to place a stent, the goal is to cover the intimal flap to prevent further flow into the mural hematoma. So if another flap is uh, missed or not covered, this will make the chance of success of your procedure uh, less likely. So this is again, a novel thing. I didn't see anything or large studies about this in the literature, but I think it has a potential use uh, in this uh, specific entity. <clears throat> now in terms of management, um, management can be observation versus medical management, man management by anti-thrombotic therapy that could be either with antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation or a vessel reconstruction or sacrifice using endovascular or surgical uh, maneuvers. Now, when you look at the guidelines by the um, American Stroke Association in 2018, this was basically a million update about the advances in thrombectomy and the uh, time window of when to do a thrombectomy, but there wasn't any uh, new statement or something uh, that would change the practice in terms of carotid dissection. Those are the two statements that were stated is that you can give IV TPA if you have a stroke in the presence, in the presence of an extracranial dissection, and you can give an IV TPA in the context of a stroke in an intracranial dissection. But if you look back to the two, 2014 guidelines, uh, basically, the, uh, uh, they indicated as a class 2A evidence that the management of those patients with either antiplatelet or anticoagulation for three to six months is reasonable. So it's an option in treatment. And the duration three to six months is that the, that's the usual time for the new endothelialization or the uh, repair of the intimal flap that, uh, that's within the, uh, uh, the intimal layer of the blood vessel. Um, and also the relative efficacy of antiplatelet therapy compared to anticoagulation uh, uh, for patients with ischemic stroke or TIA and extracranial carotid or vertebral dissection. So it was reasonable option to start antiplatelet anticoagulation. It has a relative efficacy. And in case of failure of antithrombotic uh, management, then endovascular uh, stenting primarily uh, uh, or endovascular repair uh, would be uh, your next option. And in much less circumstances, surgical reconstruction. Now, in terms of antiplatelet versus anticoagulation, when you talk about this, we have to mention the CADIS trial, which is published, uh, published in Lancet Neurology in 2015. As we all know, this was a randomized uh, trial. Uh, the enrollment was between February 2006 to June 2013. Symptomatic patients with seven-day uh, uh, within seven days, an imaging showed dissection. Either it's a definitive uh, diagnosis or a probable diagnosis. Uh, they included 250 patients, 126 received antiplatelet therapy, and 124 received anticoagulation. The primary outcome was an ipsilateral stroke or death at 90 days in the intention to treat the group. Um, <clears throat> the uh, after they did the analysis, uh, some of the patients were excluded because in reviewing the imaging, they did not actually have a definitive uh, dissection. So the uh, number of patients uh, that were included in the analysis was uh, 101 in the antiplatelet group and 96 patients in the uh, anticoagulation group. And the outcome is that the risk of stroke was relatively the same in both groups. It was 
the antiplatelet group and 1% in anticoagulation group without any statistical uh, uh, difference. Uh, so they concluded from this randomized, well-designed trial that antiplatelet or anticoagulation are both reasonable option with none of them significantly superior than the other um, in the prevention of an ischemic event following, following a carotid uh, dissection. Another uh, uh, paper, uh, 2017, published in the, uh, uh, the Red Journal, Neurosurgery. This was a retrospective cohort that basically confirmed the same finding of the CADIS trial. Uh, this patient was more, uh, this study included the carotid and vertebral. It was intra and extracranial, spontaneous and traumatic. Uh, and uh, the outcomes were stroke or TIA or hemorrhage uh, and the modified ranking scale on the last available follow-up and the need for surgical or endovascular procedure uh, as a rescue, uh, a rescue procedure. Uh, out of those patients, 108 had traumatic dissection, 58% uh, had antiplatelet therapy, uh, the majority had either aspirin or dual, uh, 26% had anticoagulation, 10% had combined treatment, and 4% were managed conservatively. And the um, ischemic event, again, did not significantly change between the groups. Uh, in this retrospective cohort, it was around 7% in the antiplatelet group uh, and 11% in the anticoagulation group. Um, now, <clears throat> one of the... Uh, protocols, basically this paper, they described their protocol is that every patient with a dissection, they would do an angiogram to assist the perfusion or the blood flow. If there is any slowing of blood flow that is manifested on uh, the blushing of the parenchymal phase of the angiogram, for example, then they would upfront treat those patients with stenting. Um, I think the concept is, 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 is very reasonable, uh, but I uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that CT perfusion will probably give you the same information. Uh, yeah, for example, if you have a dissection and the CT perfusion so showed uh, delayed uh, mean transit time and uh, decreased flow, for example, you would be very reluctant to start this patient on antiplatelet and send them home. Uh, they might need further observation, plus minus an intervention uh, down the road. So. Um, <clears throat> The, um, in conclusion, a traumatic carotid dissection is a rare entity compared to other cerebral vascular pathologies and in dissection itself, uh, spontaneous dissection seems to be more common than a traumatic dissection. High index of suspicion is needed in severe traumatic injury because as we mentioned, that only 10% of them present and 80% of those uh, will develop symptoms or evolve into an ischemic event within the first week. Initial management of antiplatelet and anticoagulation is reasonable. This was based on the guideline and based on a randomized controlled trial. Uh, further evaluation with angiogram or CT perfusion uh, might be a reasonable thing to do and when in doubt uh, about the uh, prediction of, of if the um, uh, uh, medical management will fail or not. It's when uh, we can use it as an adjunct thing to add to the information we have before we make the decision to manage this conservatively or to uh, intervene sooner. And also the potential clinical implication of the advanced imaging that uh, has gradually uh, uh, being introduced into our neurosurgical and uh, neurovascular practice, uh, which is the uh, optical coherence tomography or OCT. Uh, thank you very much.